In boardrooms and political arenas across North America, women are increasingly at the helm. Is this gender shift transforming our notions of what makes a leader? Joining us now to discuss that, in Vancouver, British Columbia, Fiona McFarlane, managing partner of the British Columbia practice for Ernst & Young and the firm's chief inclusiveness officer. And with us here in studio, Donna Dasko, founder and past national chair of Equal Voice, an organization dedicated to electing more women in Canada. Malgosha Green, chief product officer at Top Hat Monocle, an active learning platform that improves student engagement. Martha Fell, CEO at Women in Capital Markets, an organization that promotes the advancement of women in the capital markets industry. And John Duffy, founder and principal at Strategy Corp. And with that lengthy introduction for everybody, we thank you all for coming into TVO tonight. And Fiona, nice to have you on the line from the left coast. Let me start by just giving, you want to bring this up, this graphic? Look at this. This was not the case, John, when you and I were kids. <laughs> Canada's women premiers. Eva Ariak in Nunavut, Christy Clark in British Columbia, Kathy Dunderdale in Newfoundland and Labrador, Pauline Merois in the province of Quebec, Alison Redford in Alberta, and of course, as of just a couple of months ago, Kathleen Wynne here in the province of Ontario. Let's uh, go around on this. Leadership traits, I think it's fair to say, have traditionally been thought to be associated with masculine traits. And I wonder if what we're seeing at a provincial level is a sign that we are prepared to change what we perceive as leadership qualities. Fiona, why don't you get us started on that and then we'll come back here and discuss as well. Well, thank you. I, I do believe that, uh, well, there's a tremendous change in the political arena, uh, but when you look at the corp corporate Canada, uh, we're still very, very poorly represented at the helm of, of public companies. So I think that would lead us to believe that female leadership traits aren't yet fully established within Canadian culture. But maybe, Donna, in political arenas, we are making a change. Is that fair to say? I think we are making a change, and I'm, I'm really excited to see all the female premiers. And, um, you know, Steve, if you go back not too far in our history, uh, when Kim Campbell was prime minister, Lynn McLeod was leader of the Liberal, Liberal Party in Ontario, Audrey McLaughlin and so on was leader of the NDP, those women were defeated. And I think people in politics took the wrong lesson from their defeat. I think there was a sense at that time that women couldn't be successful leaders. They couldn't win elections, which is, and that, that's what political parties want to do. So in fact, what we're seeing now, I think, is represents a bit of a leg. You know, I think uh, uh, being a pollster, um, I think Canadians were ready for female political leadership well before we, we've seen these six premiers. Uh, but through a combination of circ circumstances, now we're, we've we've seen uh, we're seeing these uh, these you know these women become uh, premiers um, of their provinces, and I think it is transformational. I think it's a revolution, and I think it could have happened a few years ago. Well, and let me take. It is. I want to take John Duffy back 20 years ago, which is about when Lynn McLeod, who was one of the people you mentioned, became the first ever female leader of a major political party in Ontario, and you worked for her at the time, I think. I did. I wonder if if. Those issues around can a can a short woman from Thunder Bay exude mm -hmm. the kind of traditional leadership qualities that people think of in politics? Did you kind of wrap your head around those issues 20 years ago when she was the leader? Uh, the people around her did, uh, and and she was never too forthcoming about her own private thoughts about it, um, preferring just to focus on issues and, and the policies at hand. But sure, it was something that we thought about a lot. Um, there was this current in the air of the new female leadership that Donna was describing. Um, but it was very difficult. Uh, and I think, um, I know by way of a, a mea culpa that myself and probably one or two of the men who worked with Mrs. McLeod most closely would, would say that uh, we messed that up. Uh, we probably overcorrected. We were very worried at the time that she would be perceived as weak, that we had to overcome this sort of double standard of, a, of, a, of an implied leadership deficit. And I know I advised her to be really tough and always sound really tough, and it actually wound up making her sound not like herself. And of course, authenticity is the, the, the gold standard of politics, and I think at the time, mismanaging those issues made her uh, into someone who was not an authentic politician, and it really hurt her. And I don't think that's the same problem anymore. I don't think women uh, in, in senior political roles are facing the same problem. I think of Kathleen Wynne, who is very successfully off to a great start, in my view, projecting qualities that we traditionally associate with female leadership. 
uh, such as conciliation and willingness to listen. And, I never heard the word conversation uh, used more at Queens Park in the last two weeks than I have. Absolutely, you know, and conversation and dialogue and other mm -hmm. things that I learned from my mom, who was a strong uh, female leader. Uh, they're they're now conventional currency in Ontario politics. I think in the politics around the country and increasingly around the world. Uh, Nancy Pelosi's right. The marble ceiling, as she called it, has been, I think, definitively cracked. Martha, from your vantage point, are we starting to, are you starting to see in the general public uh, an opening to consider other qualities of leadership that aren't just six foot two and male and chest pounding and all that kind of stuff? First of all, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, whether you're a Malcolm Gladwell fan or not, and you believe that the six foot two males are the only leaders that are available throughout most of the world, um, I think that the media actually has played an important role in this because I think you'll find if you go back the last 10 years or so, there isn't a front page of a paper around the world or a commentator that isn't touching on the subject. And I think it's reached a certain, to a certain degree, tipping point. Um, from a media perspective, and I think that's helped to really throttle the work that so many organizations have been doing. I mean, WCM's only been around for 17 years. Lord knows there's lots of organizations that have been around a lot longer than that's that. Women in Capital Markets. That's yes, it is. It's Women okay. in Capital Markets. Just for those who don't know the acronym. For those that don't know. Um, and I think that, that is, it is having an impact on the leaders um, beyond the political spectrum, and whether it's on Bay Street or Wall Street or anywhere else. Unfortunately, the numbers don't suggest so far that we are having a statistical measurable difference. But I think it's certainly opening up people's minds to the thought of having more female leaders, partly because of the media agenda. But I want to touch on something John mentioned, which is you thought you were overcompensating for her to make her more tough. And I think that the perception of people's views on what demonstrates leadership um, is taking on a different tack. People, I think, generally are becoming more gender intelligent. They're not necessarily associating the same um, adjectives that they would with one gender as against the other. So, you know, you think of a woman <clears throat> potentially being assertive in a role and others might use a slightly different word, aggressive, to mm -hmm. describe it. And I think that the more we discuss the issue, the more the media places on the topic of women's advancement, I think it really opens the dialogue, the conversation around what are really what's holding us back now, given all the work that's been done. And if the topic becomes around, for example, gender intelligence, then I think it opens up people's eyes and awareness around how to really describe leadership in a non-gender way, but me, just appreciate what they bring to the table. Sure. Let me pick up on that with Mel Gosha because in politics in particular, and I'm sure um, less so on Bay Street, but <clears throat> to a certain extent as well, strong leadership means, you know, six foot two, male, breast beating, uh, looking across the floor at your opponents in the legislature or in the House of Commons and shouting them down, besting them in some kind of, you know, intellectual or macho pursuit. Do you think the public is prepared to consider other models of leadership today that don't include that? I mean, in private industry, I work in the high-tech sort of startup uh, world. I don't feel that way at all. Like, I, I rarely think about whether, um, you know, I need to act like a man or as a woman. I, I lead in a fashion that's appropriate at a given time. So sometimes you have to be aggressive, you have to be competitive, and sometimes it makes a lot more sense to uh, you know, open a dialogue uh, to be conciliatory and, and so forth. So it, I think really strong leaders know when to turn on which trait uh, in, at the right time. And I think that's really the key there. Hmm. Fiona, can you tell us whether you think, um, tell me whether you think this stereotype is true, that in the past, women leaders felt they needed to act in a certain way, as in tough enough, in order to command authority. Do you think that's still the way for women leaders, be they in politics or business today? No, I think it is changing. Um, but I think that we have to look at the statistics, and they haven't changed um, very significantly, unlike in the political arena in corporate Canada. So when you look at the number, the percentage of women CEOs, they've really, the pace has been glacial. When you look at board representation, the pace has been glacial. So. It, that tells me that there is not yet a ready, ready willingness to accept different leadership styles. 
I personally believe that balance is appropriate and there's excellent research that shows that gender balance um, at the heads of corporations on boards lead to better organizational performance and ultimately financial performance. What I find interesting about that, Donna, is the general public does not appoint CEOs, nor do they appoint members of boards. True. And yet when True. the general public has had its opportunity to weigh in, uh, it's decided that 85% of the people in this country ought to live in provinces with female premiers. <laughs> and yet the CEOs and the boards who are appointed, I guess mostly by men, are still appointing mostly men. What's wrong with this picture? Well, it, it's true, and I think, um, uh, you know, I think in the public realm, in the political realm, I, you know, it is a different dynamic to, to, to a considerable extent because leaders and politicians are supposed to represent the citizenry, and so therefore, uh, what we've seen developed over the last couple of decades is a sense that, the, you know, more of an acceptance of the diversity of the citizenry, and at the same time, more acceptance of diversity in the leadership. And when we talked to May, uh, about male leadership, you know, we were talking, you mentioned earlier the six foot two male and so on. That I, I think that's a stereotype of male leaders. If you look at our political leaders and their demeanor, their, you know, their height and so on, they've covered the spectrum. I mean, just think about them, you know, John Diefenbaker, Peter Lougheed, you know, this is not, you know, tall, dark and handsome, not, right? I mean, they've covered, the, they, they've been diverse, of course, with the exception that they've all been white. But otherwise, they've been diverse in terms of styles. Physically, you mean. Physically, their personalities have differed. Their leadership styles have, di have differed. No so one ever doubted their toughness, though. No one ever doubted Peter Lougheed's toughness or Bill Davis's toughness, even though physically they yeah. were not commanding presences. Yeah. But, uh, but, you know, but they have had diverse personalities and, and styles, and some were stronger than others. And what I am hoping we're seeing, or we're going to see with women, is, is more acceptance of female diversity in, in the way women lead because women are not all the same. Of course, there's a certain you know, conciliatory style and so on, but I think, I think that's what I'm hoping we're going to see is a greater acceptance of female diversity and we can see female premiers who are not cut from the same mold. And by the same token, as you were saying, uh, less of a, of a pressure to as John was saying, and you're saying, look like a male, this stereotypical male leader. So I'm hoping that that's going to change and we're not going to see those pressures anymore. I think those pressures are still there. Uh, John talked about it with, uh, with regard to Lynn McLeod. Think about Hillary Clinton. She's a classic example. She was, uh, from the very beginning of her strategy and campaign to, to take on, on the, uh, the nomination for the Democratic Party, tough, 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 you know, look tough, be tough, be strong. She focused on that almost exclusively. And ironically, so that didn't work. It, it didn't work in the end for whatever reasons. We could sit and talk about why she, why she didn't win. But I guess what I'm saying is that I'm, I'm hoping that those pressures, even though they are still in our political system, I'm hoping those pressures will be less as we go forward. John, you want to follow up? Th that maybe takes us to, I, <clears throat> I agree with what Donna's saying, and it takes us to an interesting point maybe about uh, what Malgoja and Martha were saying, that, that there, isn't, there is decreasingly a single style that we would call female leadership and a single style that we call male leadership. I, I use the word traditional to describe uh, those things. Two of the most fascinating characters in this story are the sort of pioneering gender benders, um, being Margaret Thatcher, who you and I grew up watching, uh, and, and, and you would have cut your teeth watching, um, who, of course, famously was tougher than any, than any man around her. Um, the other one is Mrs. Clinton's husband, Bill, who could do sensitive and empathetic traits that we traditionally associate with females better than many women. You cannot imagine Winston Churchill sitting down and saying to anybody, I feel your pain. <laughs> and you can't mm -hmm. imagine Margaret Thatcher saying that either. Mm -hmm. um, that is a role, and it just shows that these bendings of, of, of gender roles were maybe essential predicates to breaking up these stereotypes mm. in the whole. I think, I think the mm. breakup of the stereotype is probably the biggest thing here. We're not seeing so much a rise in female brand leadership as I think a removal of discrimination that says women for a variety of reasons simply aren't suitable. And I think we are seeing a diversity of what we think of leadership as. I think there's some complicated reasons as to why this is happening a little bit faster at the top reaches of politics. I think a lot of them have to do with career paths. Uh, increasingly, politicians at the top rank are drawn from much more diverse career paths 
than they used to be. Stephen, you've written books about the kinds of people who become politicians in the Canadian experience, very, very distinguished books. And you've written eloquently about how they're no longer all lawyers, and they're no longer all male lawyers, and they no longer, there are very few business people in politics anymore. Um, what's happened instead is they come from a much wider diversity and different career paths, and they come in at different ages and stages. Most CEOs that I know are in their mid to late 50s and have gone to business school at a certain time of their life and have marched very steadily through the ranks. Mm -hmm. The <laughs> facts of mothering and family formation cut against that and I think have made it harder for the classic CEO role to be occupied by a female because of that career track than has been the case with politics where they are starting to pop in from all kinds of diverse backgrounds. That's a shame and I hope it'll start to correct itself. Well, until it does, I'm going to read a little selection here from Joan Walsh writing in Salon.com from a few days ago. And until it does, this is what women in the business world are dealing with. In one well-known study, participants are presented with the story of a hard-charging venture capitalist, but in one group, he's named Howard, and in the other group, Heidi. The results are the same among women as men. Howard is admired, Heidi is a bitch. Okay, Martha, based on your personal experience and what you know about business trends, how accurate is that? Sadly, there is quite a bit of accuracy to it. Um, I have heard that particular case many times and I think it does a good job in demonstrating that issue of gender bias. There is a natural inclination for all of us to associate in different or in the same circumstances different players in different ways based on their gender. Um, there are a lot of barriers um, that are pretty obvious to women's advancement particularly on Bay Street. When you enter into Bay Street like I did in my you know post-university first career and I walked onto a trading floor and I looked at the room of 300 faces and did the, oh my God. How many were men? Uh, 75, 80% of them, which was unusual because if I look at the stats that we've done with Catalyst in benchmarking the industry in, in Canada based on the six big investment banks, it's actually 83% men in line positions and then it falls to 9% when you look at managing directors and above. And that study was done first in 1999. We redid it every three years. And the last study was done in 2008. And the numbers had not changed. It was still 17 and 9%, mm -hmm. which reflects badly on all of the effort that went into trying to improve the diversity, inclusive, um, diversity inclusiveness within those institutions. But if I looked at anecdotally what I felt when I first came on the trading floor versus when I left, which was around 2007, there's a dis demonstrable change. It was a really big difference between the culture, the camaraderie, um, to a certain extent, I guess you could say how you were treated or how you were perceived, and it was much better. You know, we used in our most recent study that was not quantitative, it was a qualitative study, um, down on the industry, we studied and, and asked a number of participants in the industry what their perceptions were. And it was very interesting to see the difference in perceptions between what people thought of the industry, what those in the industry felt, but more importantly, what those in the industry at the senior level thought of women's advances Which versus the women. Oh, versus in, the women. What did you find? In the business. Um, that there's a strong perception that it is a boorish industry. And yet a lot of the women, when asked the similar type of questions, said, well, it's actually not that bad. I do love my job. I love my career. I'm motivated um, by a number of different things, many of which match what motivate men in this business. And what I think was the other interesting um, piece that we got from the study was the fact that a lot of the C-suite, who are very familiar with all of the efforts that they're putting into women's advancement in their firms, were quite differing in their views of the issue and how far they thought they'd come versus how far women thought they had or had not come. And there was some big differences there. And it was the spotlight on, I guess, the difference between reality versus perception that's really drawn attention to the fact that we really haven't. We've come some, some degree, but not enough. Can I follow up with you on that? You, you work in an industry where there are, if I can put it this way, sounding like an old fogey, a lot of young people doing their thing, right? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and are there diff in, in the next generation coming up behind, are there apparently different attitudes about male and female leadership that you can see at this stage of the game? I mean, I would say so. I would say for the most part, it's still a male-dominated industry. I, in my current office, there's maybe three women. Um, and how many men? 
50 or so. 50 yeah. versus three. Yeah, so it's still, for the most part, almost always exclusively worked with men. But I, you're in an online world, right? Yes. Which is very dominated by I mean, high tech, a lot of engineers. I mean, I studied engineering. My class was more diverse than most, so it was about 25% women. Um, but for the most part, I, I was struggling to think of one woman I've worked with who was in a leadership position, sort of at my level or above me Are there in my any? entire career. I think I've worked with one. Um, uh, when Marissa Mayer? No, no. <laughs> Not her. <laughs> Not Marissa Mayer. <laughs> but you mentioned this um, quote from, uh, what was it, Salon? Yes, yeah, Salon. John yeah, I, I read that one. And I actually, when I read that uh, article, I looked up what the statistics were for venture capitalists, um, women venture capitalists. And Forbes did a top 100 list last year, and there were five women on it. And the first woman, um, Mary Meeker, entered at 42. So hmm. it's pretty... Uh, you know, it's pretty bad actually. And when you think about it, if you're an entrepreneur who, a, late, a woman entrepreneur who's looking to raise funding, you're basically going from uh, door to door of just purely pitching men. And it, it can be a little bit um, you know, intimidating at first, but I think you just kind of get over it and you move on. So I've seen, um, sort of to get back to your question, I've seen more and more women uh, starting their own businesses in the, in the tech sector. So I, I know quite a few right now who let, are going that direction. Let me follow up with Fiona. We, we need to understand some of the whys behind all of this. And I wonder whether the, the men who clearly dominate the industries that we're talking about here, whether they just still don't see female qualities as being of satisfactory leadership or demonstrating satisfactory leadership that they don't hire women. I don't know. What is it? You tell me. Well, I think there's a very human phenomenon um, called bias, and, I th and it was mentioned by one of your guests. Um, we're all biased. We're biased in favor of our family or alumni, alumni from our university. And, uh, and so there is a lot of bias within, um, within our society, and particularly in corporate Canada. And so if you, um, it's very, very hard to um, understand that one has bias. It takes a lot of self-awareness. Um, there's some excellent work done out of Harvard by uh, Dr. Mazreen Banaji, and you can actually go onto the Harvard website and test your own bias. And, uh, and I was very surprised that I had a mild bias against women working, hmm. um, which I've always worked. <laughs> I'm in my 50s. But it comes from that, um, that sense of what does a leader look like? What do women do? Um, and I think it's, an, it's something that it would serve people well to everybody to test their own biases, biases so that you can check them at the door when you're making important decisions. John. I just want to mention some areas where there's been some tremendous progress and try to suggest maybe that what's happening in corporate Canada